It is interesting to me in that song the sentiments of the writer was manifested the idea of a place where there's no strife no pain, no anguish, no things of that nature. Well, the Bible's description of heaven causes us to realize it's so far different from our life here. The closest we have to being in heaven is really to assemble with saints of like precious faith who are all being governed by our Savior and His authoritative will. And in that way, we have a brief, very minor taste of heaven in the unity that's there. In the model prayer, Jesus had us all realize that we are to pray that God's will be done on earth, even as in heaven. Well, of course, in heaven there's no flaw, there's no deviation from God's will. But here on earth, it's another story. But the Lord's church, the spiritual body of Christ, the family of God, the kingdom of heaven, composed of all those that are saved by their obedience to the gospel, then it should be a place where there's no strife, but yet when you read your New Testament, it doesn't take long. After the church was established in Acts chapter 2 to see that there were problems in the church. Well, when we say there are problems in the church, that means problems when it comes to members of the church, not just outside persecutors of the church by unbelievers and pagans and so forth. But when you also read the rest of the New Testament, as we've commented most often, most of it's written to members of the church and individuals about their life in the church, how to live as a Christian. So today I would like to spend a little time on what we must be willing to face if we're to remain faithful each one of us, to the Lord in His church. And that is we must face troublemakers in the church. Now it would be easy to say let's just ignore those. But the Bible doesn't ignore them. In fleshly Israel, which is a type of the Lord's spiritual Israel, the church, you had all sorts of troublemakers in the church. And when you study the New Testament... You see, as I've already commented on, there were troublemakers in the church. Now, trouble can come in various ways. You can be troubled because you did just exactly what God wanted you to do. perfect example of that is Jesus Christ, God in the flesh. He was flawless. He was sinless, although he was suffered temptations and trials like all people did because he was a man, but he was God in the flesh. And thus, he handled every one of them like he ought to. And yet, he was put to death. A most ignominious death and shameful, painful death. And yet, he was the Son of God. He was flawless. He told his apostles while he was helping them to understand why he chose them to be apostles that if people have treated me the way they've treated me, and of course, at the time he was saying that, he had not gone to the ultimate persecution of the garden and then the torments before his crucifixion and the actual crucifixion. He says, they're going to hate you. Well, then Paul tells Timothy that all who live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. As I've said several times already, it doesn't take long reading the New Testament after the church was established that there were people in the church who caused troubles. Now, as I said, the Lord's church was established on the first Pentecost following the resurrection of Christ, as Luke records in Acts chapter 2. We all recognize that it was purchased with the precious blood of Jesus Christ, Acts 20 and verse 28. Thus, the church is a divine institution did not originate in the mind of man, but God originated it. It is the institution to which Christ adds all of those who are forgiven of their sins, who are saved by Him as they obey the gospel of Christ, which gospel is God's power to save us, Romans 1 verse 16. 
But we recognize by the comments I've already made and from your own personal study of the Bible and your own experience if you're a Christian that the church is made up, it is composed of fallible human beings. And we need to keep in mind as we live, as the Bible directs us, that the church has both a human and a divine side. But I read in the scriptures about the church, I'm reading about the divine side, the church in the eternal wisdom of God, and I see that it's absolutely perfect. But the human side, the actual members that compose the church is imperfect and subject to mistakes. Now, that's one reason for a sermon like this. That's one reason you pray and you study and you encourage one another and we're mindful of our brethren that uh, would sin and we know our obligations to God as faithful Christians toward brethren who sin and so on. So the Lord in his infallible word tells us how to keep the church like the Lord wants it. But if you're going to be faithful, you cannot let members of the church, when they go astray, disappoint you. That's going to test whether your faith is in God, in Christ, and the word of God, or whether it's been placed wrongly in men. Yes, we should be able, and the Bible teaches that's the case, to look to godly people as good examples by their pattern of life and walk after them. We're even told to do that kind of thing, and that's part of the fellowship we enjoy in the church. But everybody ultimately is responsible for his own thoughts, for his own words, and his own actions. And every one of us must bear that burden. We must be determined to have the mind of Christ and what it takes to have the mind of Christ. That's why we're Christians. So the human side of the church is made just as clear as you study your New Testament as is the divine side. Now it's good, and I underscore, write and bold, or whatever you want to, the word good, that inspired writers did not conceal the weaknesses and the errors and mistakes from us of our brethren of almost 2,000 years ago when the New Testament was being written and when inspiration was still in men, apostles walked this earth. For if that all had been concealed from us, we, we might have concluded that there would arise no problem, no problems at all in the true church. And we would be, as some people have deluded themselves into being, that once I become a Christian, everything is a bed of roses. Well, that last song wouldn't even be, used, uh, wouldn't be any use to sing. That's saying that here, laboring for the Lord, you will undergo privation and hurt to one extent or the other, and you will have to work on yourself because the ultimate and final blessing of eternity in heaven is yet to come. There's where the reward is. So even during the lives of men inspired of the Holy Spirit and as the Bible, the New Testament in particular, was being written, then we read of problems. And one of those problems was early on uh, as far as the layout of the scriptures they're put together in the church at Corinth. Paul had to deal with those brethren about unity. He had to deal with them. That's in 1 Corinthians 1, 10 and 11. He had to deal with them about immorality, 1 Corinthians 5.1. We pause there and we see people who heard the same gospel we've heard. It's the same gospel you read of in the scriptures. It's God's power to save us. We understand the terms of the gospel and so on, of hearing the gospel, understanding it, believing in Christ on the basis of it, repenting of our sins, confessing our faith in Christ and being immersed in water by the authority of Christ for the remission of our sins, and knowing the Lord remits his, our sins and adds us to his church. And yet, how could these in Corinth who heard that gospel, were converted to Christ, still get themselves involved in such things as the division Paul addresses and rebukes them on and corrects them on, and the terrible immorality that they had? But they did... And that's recorded there. Now, why is it recorded? 
since the Bible's written for you and for me, except to enlighten us and say, this is what you're going to face. There will be things like that among brethren. And yet the same Bible tells us here the way you rectify it. Here's the way you deal with it. Here's the way you work through it. And you keep yourself as you ought to be. Uh, if you look in uh, 1 Corinthians 15, where the church in Corinth was teaching false doctrine on the resurrection, you see that it's corrected, verse 12. It's, it's, it's recognized. It's not swept under the rug. And Paul teaches them better on that. Even when they were abusing the Lord's Supper, in 1 Corinthians 11, he meets it right up front, and he shows them how they were abusing it. And he corrects it. But these are all trouble in the church. When he addresses the Thessalonians in the second letter, in 2 Thessalonians 3 and verse 6, he talks about how that they were disorderly in their conduct, how that that should not be. You read 1 Corinthians 14 and you'll see that all things are being done decently and in order. Well, that means there's authority to appeal to. And it's the same authority that every Christian appeals to. If it's the right authority, and that's the authority of Christ. So somebody wasn't abiding by the authority, but these are Christians. These have obeyed the gospel. They're assembling to worship. They're different in many ways because they are Christians from the people around about them. But there's trouble in the church. And they're expected to work through that and to correct those things. So in effect, they're being challenged as members of the church to keep the church like the Lord wants it. He's the head of the church. His will is to be done in the church. And that means that we're never blind to our brothers and sisters' departure from, from the faith, whether it's uh, one thing or 15. It doesn't make any difference. Our love for God, our love for ourselves, and our love for our brethren and the truth will cause us to be mindful of what we do, of how we act, how we speak, and so on. This is another thing about the most of the New Testament. Keep in mind, it was written to keep the church saved. There's the matter of strife and envy that James addresses in James 3.14, how that that should not exist among members of the church, but it did, and it got addressed and corrected in such passages as James 3.14. It's even interesting to show you how many new things get that you have the sin of being a busybody or a meddler in other men's matters, 1 Peter 4, 15 and 2 Thessalonians 3, 11. So that's even showing us that uh, you can poke your nose sometimes into other person's matters, to use our modern terminology, and when it's wrong to do that. It also implies that there are private matters that belong only to the individual Christian that, frankly, it's another way of saying it's none of your business. I think some people have an idea of, of fellowship among Christians that every, everybody is, uh, is an open book and what's his business is my business and I make it a part to try to know everything there is about somebody else. After all, I've got to have something to talk about and I, I can't talk about you. So... That kind of thing is condemned. It's, it's made clear to be a sin. It's a part of not living like the Bible says. So if we don't know that such sins existed in the church as the New Testament was being written, in fact, they were the occasions for much of the inspired writings to be written, and all of this was from the beginning, then we might grow discouraged, and some do. We might grow weary and well-doing. When we finally see that those evils are in the church today that were in the church in the first century as the Bible was being completed in the form of the New Testament. So what is that saying? It means when I see brethren sin, it shouldn't just pull the rug out from under me. When I see people that are we think are what they claim to be, but they turn out to be something else, why should that challenge my faith? My faith is not in people. My faith is in God and Christ and the Bible. 
It makes a person sorrowful to see that their brethren go off into sin or they trouble the Lord's church. And there's a point right here to be made. None of these sins I mentioned and any other sin committed by a member is not an isolated thing. In other words, it doesn't just bother that one person who actually did the sinning. It hurts the whole body. And that draws from Paul's own uh, talking about the body. You know, and he says, you know, there is no one part of the body of Christ that's not important. And again, you've all done this to yourself. You ever get a paper cut on your little finger and you take note of that all over. Or you ever stump your toe? I remember one time, just a kid, I couldn't have been, well, I don't know how old I was, but I'm about eight. My father's mother lived up the street from us, would we'd say be about a block from us now, maybe a little more than that. And there were some huge sweet gum trees out front, and I started walking up there one day. I remember it was Daddy was home for lunch. I don't know why I went up there then, but I did. But what I remember is I stumped my big toe one of the roots of that thing and took the whole end of it off. And I remember that to this day. And uh, my whole body hurt. And we've all done things like that. Well, wouldn't it be wonderful if we had that kind of attachment to one another as members of the body of Christ where we had that kind of concern? And, and you see that kind of concern presented when you see Paul addressing the churches of Galatia. He uh, mentioned that kind of, uh, how would you say, closeness, that connection that would be there. Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, American Standard says, trespass. Ye which are spiritual, Restore such an one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. And immediately after that, in verse 2, he says, Bear ye one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. There is then that type of burden to which I can apply the truth of God in my life and help somebody. I think you see that demonstrated in this same letter when Paul had to withstand Peter to the face because he was to be blamed. That's Paul bearing that burden in the way that we're instructed to do that here. Yet a little later on in verse 5 of Galatians 6, he says, For every man shall bear his own burden. Well, I can do all I can to teach a person. I can show a person whether they're in violation of the truth, whether he's a brother or not. But then that person must be willing to receive the instruction and see him or herself as God sees them and willing to do whatever the Bible requires for them to be saved, which is namely repent of their sins and pray God for forgiveness if they're members of the church. Well, again, the big thing you can do to help yourself and in teaching others is to make clear that human nature has not changed. Technology's changed, language has changed. Clothing styles change, etc. But the human is still bearing the attributes of being a human. And this is why the Bible is such an up-to-date book. It's always fresh and new to every generation. And through a study then of the scriptures, guess what we see? Well, we say we see the strong points in man, but we see the weaknesses too. And we see the good things they do, but we see the problems that arise today are not really any different than they were then. So the early church had its troublemakers, and it would do us good to study them and their characteristics. Very quickly, think about Diotrephes. John speaks of him as one who loves to have the preeminence, 3 John verse 9. Well, unfortunately, the tribe of Diotrephes is still with us. And let's suppose the world lasts 10,000 years of the future. I guarantee you there will be Diotrephes right to the end. It's somewhat amusing to me. You can almost chuckle about it if it wasn't such a serious thing. Is that many elders think Diotrephes must have been a preacher. And many preachers think Diotrephes must have been one of the elders. Well, it doesn't say he was an elder or a preacher, but he was a person who had such control in that church that uh, he could cause the church 
to exalt him. And he had such power over them, and they wouldn't do it except they'd been taught to believe it, that he could exclude people from it or whatever, and they would let him do it. And it all came from his desire, his love to have the preeminence. He always wanted to be in the chief position. John said he pratted against us with malicious words. So he didn't have a kind thing to say about John, possibly the other apostles. It's not uncommon to find this fellow Dotrophy still around today. Well, what am I to do to help brethren understand that? Expect to find him somewhere. Don't think he'll never show up again. That happened only in the first century church. No. It's there written to teach us. There will always be people like that. Now, is that going to challenge my faith? Well, it really shouldn't. It should just cause me to know they're going to be there. But he's not going to operate on me to de depreciate my work in the church. But then as you go further in Philippians chapter 4 and the church at Philippi, which the, Paul had a lot of so many good things to say about their dedication to the Lord and support of him. He mentioned Jodius and Syntyche. These are two women in the church at Philippi. And Paul urged them to be of the same mind. Well, some way there was a difference in them. And it was something Paul said shouldn't be. And you ought to be of the same mind. Well, I do know that 1 Corinthians 1.10, he said to the whole church of Corinth, they ought to be of the same mind and the same judgment. And he says to these women, you ought to be of the same mind. I don't know what Adam separated. But if they're following the same head, they ought to know then those obligations that one has or the obligations the other one has in service to Christ. And if they're matters of just dislikes and likes, or to let it go. So he spoke of them as women which labored with me in the gospel. So they're not people that are near do wells in the church. They had worked with him in some way is when he labored to preach the gospel. Well, they had fallen in some sort of disagreement, and Paul says, you're the ones to straighten it out. Nobody else can really do it but you, yet you can. Think about what it means to be a Christian. That's what you are, sisters in Christ, under the head of Christ. Is this godly? Is this, is this uh, being a sister in Christ as you ought? So we're not told the nature of the disagreement. But we know that it troubled the church and Paul as an apostle told them to correct the matter. So there are going to be personal disagreements in the church today. And if they're not handled correctly, they can hurt the whole church. And it's not going to fare well with those brethren on the day of judgment if it's not corrected. But we leave that, and we're not taking these in order as they appear in the Scriptures. But now the very first sin, in fact, in the church was brought about by Ananias and Sapphira. You know, we wouldn't know a thing about them if inspiration hadn't told us about it. There would have been no way for Peter the Apostle to have dealt with them as the Scripture says he did, except as an apostle God gave him insights into their secrets because these things were known only as far as humans are concerned between the husband and wife and Nice and Sapphira. They had simply lied about their gift and it was all to gain the praise of men, Acts 5, 1 through 11. What they've done, they've placed personal ambition and pride above the cause of Jesus Christ. And uh, they didn't hesitate to lie about it. And that all fit into their foolish, sinful desires. And they actually transgressed what Paul said later when he said in Colossians 3, 9, lie not one to another, but they did. And I think you can see how God feels about the matter rather quickly since he killed both of them for it. Now, somebody said if he killed people today outright like that for lying, There'd be a lot of places would be depopulated in a hurry because it's not a thing for a person to wear the name of Christ and tell falsehoods. Revelation 21 8 makes it clear that liars have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. 
So we need to be mindful you're going to run across people that may lie to you in the church. What are we to do about it? Well, I've seen people say, well, I'm not going to have anything to do with them anymore. But already it was happening 2,000 years ago when the church was new and the New Testament wasn't even fully written. And it happened. But what does that tell me? How does that fortify me? It's going to happen. There will be those people. I'm not saying it's not a sad situation. It's not a bad situation. Of course it is. It brings trouble to God's people. God's people will be known as peacemakers as God defines that peace and the way it's made. But then you also have, we talked about him a while back, Demas. He's a pattern we don't want to follow. He loved the world more than he loved the church. And he forsook Paul when he was most needed. Paul just says he's loved this present world, 2 Timothy 4.10. But in Colossians 4.14, he had been mentioned as a companion of Paul in Paul's great labors for the Lord. Well, the church is in the world. God meant it to be that way, just like a boat is to be in the water. But he never intended for the world to be in the church any more than we would want water to be in a boat, and enough of it sinks the boat. So the church is in a constant battle to keep its members faithful to Christ. If you think about it, you have a personal responsibility to yourself to keep yourself faithful. In a family, if they're all Christians, they have a responsibility one to another to begin right there in that small unit to keep it like the Bible says. And then the family of God, the church, has responsibilities to itself to keep it pure and to keep the members faithful to God. So worldly-minded people and worldly actions just simply weaken the church and expose it to the shame uh, of the world. And this is, of course, the opposite from what God intended because we're to be the leavening for good in the world. Our examples are to be how Christ lives on this earth and how we deal with things then are supposed to be how Christ would deal with them. The last ones we'll notice is Hymenaeus and Philetus. These men actually taught false doctrine concerning the resurrection. Don't know all that it was, but that's what it was about. They didn't teach the truth of the resurrection. And Paul lumps it into what he calls profane and vain babbling, 2 Timothy 2, 16-17, Think about that for a while, and any doctrine contrary to the doctrine of Christ is profane and vain. That is, it's pointless or empty or worthless. It doesn't edify anybody to make them better Christians. Usually it's allowing them to live more like the world and feel like they're all right. Uh, Webster defines babbling just to be foolish talking, uh, even uh, talking excessively. Some of you have heard me tell about the lady years and years ago who said she was talking to the person not a member of the church and she asked her a question and the member of the church said I couldn't answer it so I just kept on talking well I've uh, that amazed me then and amazes me now uh, she didn't know what to say but she kept on talking so what did she say I would be willing to say profane and vain babblings is all that came out if she didn't know the answer but she kept on talking the Bible teaches us to shun such folks. And what havoc at times is such things wrought in the Lord's church because they didn't work to try to keep their tongue. And again, I refer you to James 3 where that was a problem. And James, by the Holy Spirit, writing part of the New Testament, addressed that in those days. Now, one of the things I want to make clear is that this lesson is something that the church will need every day until the Lord comes back. It's needed it ever since the church was established, when it was, the Bible was being finished in the revelation of the New Testament. And it's needed it forever because we're human beings. The best thing in the world to do for yourself is to realize I'm subject to committing any one of these sins. I can slide off into any one of them, any other one. I think one of the things the devil sells us on is that, well, I'm a Christian now. I, 
I, I can't be, yeah, I won't be bothered by any of these things. None of these things will be a problem to me. Well, you're probably about to be more bothered by them when you take that attitude than if you said, I may trip any minute. Uh, some of us have, especially in our younger years, spent time out in the fields and the woods, and we hunted and grew up that way. And you were particular where you put your foot. If you go out in the woods these days and very, even now, in a thicket, whatever, you don't just go wading through. There are little things called snakes, and some of them are poisonous, and they don't like being walked upon. <laughs> they have a way of showing you pretty quickly. So you're careful, careful about a lot of things. If you want to make it to a more modern day, you just don't go up here in I-40 or these others, I-45, and just run across without paying attention. There are people that almost every week get run over and killed because they're trying to cross in the traffic. You're not cautious, you're not careful, you're not circumspect, you're not caring for yourself as you ought to if you blunder around like that. Well, spiritually speaking, if you think, well, none of these bother me and I'm not guilty of any of them, you're subject to committing any one of these sins that anybody else ever committed. And you keep yourself, you manage your mind, and you work on it. I've often said, and it's still true, no matter how often it's said, that is, the battle to serve the Lord is one in the mind. You keep your mind in subjection to Christ. And when you see your mind going somewhere it shouldn't, then you rebuke yourself and deal with it. If brethren would do that kind of thing in the, from the proper study of the Bible and programmed with the truth and letting the truth govern them to know what their thoughts ought to be, then uh, they would have a patrol of the mind if you please and they would detect those things and head it off before it even gets beyond the mind that's what we ought to be trying to do but as we close the lesson as we read of these few troublemakers in the church as we've noticed them here we should be built up scripturally we should be edified we can see these case studies that inspiration has given us of the early church and from them, we can always be striving to bring our own individual lives in subjection to the truth and not become a, a troublemaker in the church needlessly. Now, I'm not talking about, as I close the lesson, I'll end where, end it where I started. I'm not talking about the person that stands up and declares the truth out of a life that's righteous and somebody says, you're a troublemaker like Ahab did to the prophet and he said he was a troublemaker because he wouldn't tell him what he wanted to hear he just told him the truth all the time so I'm not talking about getting in trouble for telling the truth or living the truth I'm talking about getting into trouble and troubling the church because we sin and won't correct it so we always and may we always strive to be builders and not wreckers in the church and that'll be when we take seriously why, what God's given here and say this is just the way it is and we'll deal with them as they come but they're not going to destroy my faith in God and Christ and the gospel system it's always been that way there have always been people who've done this but we have the teaching of God of how to deal with it first of all as it impacts me and then how to deal with it with my brothers and sisters like Ananias Sapphire or Diotrephes or whoever it may be and we're going to work on it to keep the church like our Lord wants the church to be. And you know, when you do that, when you do that, you haven't got time <laughs> to be off into something else. You'll be busy always because of the very nature of humans. And even though they believe and obey the gospel, they still stumble into things. I often think, and I'll close here, we're couples marry and they're looking for their first child and they're so thrilled for those children to get there and all of this and yet they're human beings and they will grow and develop and they're going to cause you some trouble and you can love them with all the power God gave you to love your own but they're going to cause you concern if they don't even cause you trouble and the Bible fortifies you to deal with it. What about spiritual family of God? Why should we think it's going to be any different? But it shouldn't destroy our faith. If you're subject to the good invitation of our Lord, we invite you to come while we stand and sing.